Now, they got a chance right now. They can repent and get out of this whole deal. But it's still, as it's always been, the prophets have proclaimed it, repent or what? Perish. But today, you can do those things and you don't perish. You get to live another day to do them again. Is that not true? And if a man comes and says, that's what we've got to have, or the land's going to be laid ruined, they'll look at you and consider you not a Christian. Absolutely. And they'll bring up the woman taken at the well. Uh, not the woman at the well, excuse me. The woman taken in adultery. You know, let him who is without sin cast the first stone. Judge not, lest you be judged. It's really kind of interesting, this judging deal. Because if I come along judging, they'll, they don't say to me, well, I'm not going to judge you just because you're judging people. They don't do that. Because they are the hypocrites. Jesus said the Pharisees were hypocrites. And when you get the leaven of the Pharisee in your mind, you are so hypocritical, you are so out of your mind because Christ is so far out of your mind that you will judge the judger for judging. And then you'll say, I don't judge. And then you don't even recognize that Jesus said, Stoner! The only reason they didn't stone her that there was nobody to step forward. There had to be the law, had to be kept. He said, let him who's without sin cast the first stone. He had written something in the sand that scared all of them. I think he had listed names and dates and call girls of all the guys that he had right around him right there in the sand. And they knew that they were guilty of the same thing. And they skedaddled. But it's just like the people say when you try to present to them Baptism, remission of sins. Well, what about the thief on the cross? Like the thief on the cross negates what Peter said. I can answer that question as about why the thief on the cross was saved without baptism because he was in the old covenant. He was given salvation before Christ died. But Christ has died, and if you want the salvation, you're going to have to cover, follow his last will and testament. That's a whole other thing. But it's like we've got these little cliches just to pass things away. Our minds have been taken captive. I'll give you an illustration. I haven't got to the main point because I want this sermon today to end with Satan stopping. But I'm going to give you an illustration of a man who doesn't even know his mind has been taken over. It happened several years ago. I got, I got an email from him. He was a man that brought me to Christ. It was back in 1970. I was fighting sex education that was coming into the public schools here in this community. I was just a young man, not a preacher at the time. And uh, he got involved in the fight. And he saw that I was a young man searching, and he started having Bible studies with me. He's a fine preacher at the time, anyway, before his mind was taken over. Uh, preachers have had their minds taken over, too. But anyway, uh, he baptized me and my wife and my little boy. He was just a little tiny guy standing at the baptistry. We got baptized at midnight at night when I saw that I needed to be baptized. I can still remember him standing there looking at his mom and dad getting dunked in water. But anyway, uh, I hadn't seen him for multiple years. And I get an email, and he had seen that on the Internet that the government calls me a hate group leader, and they call me a racist. I want to tell you something. Would you like to be called a racist? All you have to do is teach the truth, that God made a covenant with Abraham. And he said to Abraham, and you can read about it in Genesis chapter 17, Abe, I'm going to tell you what. I'm going to change your name to Abraham, and a multitude of nations are going to come from your loins. And so you start teaching and you start researching and you start presenting who those nations are. The Jews today have never had a multitude of people come from them. Black people have never had a multitude of nations come from them. But there is a group, the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian, Celtic, and kindred people who have had... <laughs> that was sweeter, wasn't it? <laughs> uh, one grandchild brought the little, uh, little uh, switch for the mother for the other kids. <laughs> Traitor! Traitor! <laughs> anyway, where was I? 
Abraham's seed formed the multitude of nations. And when you point out who those nations are, the Anglo-Saxon, Germanic, Scandinavian, and Celtic, and kindred people, racist, racist, racist! That's the scream. That's, what, what is that? That your mind has been taken captive. You see what I'm saying? And, and you have these knee-jerk reactions. And so the church world today goes through all these contortions and gyrations to make the church into spiritual Israel. As if I couldn't answer that. But we're past that now. If you want to be one of the wise virgins, I tell you what, we, we can't go back to those things. But I'll tell you, if you start even... I'm addressing a crowd in my mind's eye, not just the crowd here, but the ones out there that understand who the true Israel people are. But understand this, if you stand up and proclaim that truth, they will attack you as a hater and as a racist and as a cult leader and as an extremist. The whole works. It's all slander. That's the purpose of it. So this man had read about all this, and he wrote to me, and he says, I have prayed for you. And uh, I wrote back to him. I hadn't heard from him in years. I said, I want to, first of all, thank you for praying for me, because I know you, the man I knew, I knew well enough that if he says he's praying for you, he's praying for you. And it's pretty kind. And I said, I wa I've always wanted to thank you. I said, when I walk out of my house, walk over to my office there on the radio ranch, I look up on the hill. And I said, up on the hill, there's a graveyard where I planted my son and his mama. And I always try to say every day, Oh, death, where is thy sting? Graves you shall open. And I said, If you hadn't have been there in my life those many years ago and brought me to Christ, I would not have this hope. And I just always wanted to thank you for that. And I thanked him. And then I explained some things to him. I said, I'm not worthy to be put at the top of the list as a hate group by the government, but uh, I'm humbled and I gladly accept it. <laughs> and then uh, I had some communication going back, and I got a point here to make, and then I got to get going here. But the point I want is how his mind has been taken over, and he was corresponding back to me, and he's a chaplain. Uh, he has sort of a, a ministry in, in prisons, and there's a lot of homosexuals in prison, I guess. And he was telling me that... Uh, the, another man who was a preacher was a chaplain, but he stood out against homosexuality. And as a result, the one warden in this one prison who is a homosexual kicked him out. Wouldn't let him come in to, to minister to the prisoners. But he hasn't kicked out this preacher that brought me to the Lord. And this preacher said this, It's not easy becoming a homosexual to reach homosexuals for Christ. He said, it's not easy to become a homosexual to reach homosexuals for Christ. But if that's what I have to do to reach homosexuals, I'll, I'll do that. Yeah, and I thought, my God, his mind. He's been taken captive. He's out of his mind. Now, I don't mean that I don't, surely he hasn't physically become a homosexual. But what he's trying to say is he's become all things to all men to reach some for Christ. You see what I'm saying? And in his mind, he's becoming a homosexual to reach homosexuals for Christ. Hey, I come to you in the name of Jesus. But that's how he can get in there to do it, see? So I wrote back and I said, you know, I've always enjoyed your sermons. I'm holding a conference at such and such place, and it's not too far from him. And I said, Would you, I'd like, love to have you come and speak. I'd love to hear one of your sermons. And he wrote back and he says, no way, there's too much difference between you and me. And then this is the last correspondence I had to him. I said, well, I, I just thought maybe it might be easy, easier to become a white supremacist, to win some white supremacists for Christ, <laughs> than it would become a homosexual. You see the hypocrisy? The mind's been taken over. Now, faith is a part of your mind. And Pastor Applegate's Sunday school class was girding your mind for action. And you have got to have a renewal in your mind. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And if I just look at the scene today, what they've got planned, there's no hope. You see what I'm saying? But I look beyond that. I look at the Word and I stand on the Word. And the Word is true. Now, we have an obligation. When I say we, I'm talking to an elite group now. 